Good afternoon, my friends, the doctors in the house. Excellent. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of To Your Health with Dr. G. My name is Dr. Mark Gomez. I'm the host of the show. People call me Dr. G, and today we are continuing our Countdown to Summer series. So, every week, we started this a couple weeks ago, and each week leading up to summer, we've got a nice topic, and we're talking about summertime preparedness. Today, we're actually going to be talking about uh, summertime skin care secrets. So, uh, those of you that are new to the program, welcome. Those that have been faithful with us and following us all this time, welcome back. Today, we're going to be talking about skin. And everybody loves talking about skin, so we're going to get some great discussion going on today. For those that are new to the program, what I do each week is we break down a topic. I invite some of my friends that are in the medical industry that are experts at their craft, and we talk about the topic. And at the end of the day, we want you guys that are listening to us or watching us on Facebook Live to feel really empowered about your health decisions. We want you to do everything that you can to stay healthy as you take care of your families and live healthy and fruitful lives. So before we get into the topic today, of course, let me hit you with a quick disclaimer. All right. The content of To Your Health with Dr. G is for informational and entertainment purposes only and that the content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, and or treatment. Further details can be found at https www.toyourhealthwithdrg.com slash disclaimer. So again, welcome back. We're continuing this countdown to summer series. Summertime is a great time, and I love, love when we kind of get ready for all the fun things that we can do. The kids are out. The family's having fun road trips, and in particular today, skin. Skin, skin, skin. And uh, I, I, yeah, essentially, I, 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 get a lot of, I get a lot of skin type things that present to me in my primary care practice, but I really like talking about skin because we got some experts today that can really take it to the next level. But summertime, we're out, we're poolside, we're at vacation, we're doing camping, and this is a time when skin gets really vulnerable. Not to say that skin's not vulnerable year round, but this is a really big time. So uh, I always kind of joke around with people. I say, sunburns are almost inevitable, almost like taxes. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and I know, I know, of course, my guests today can comment on that in much more detail. I want to do a quick shout out to our Gold Level sponsor, Elta MD Skincare. Check them out, www.eltamd.com. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez, host of To Your Help with Dr. G. You can check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at To Your Health Dr. G. Check me out on my website, www.drmarkgomez.com. So, before I introduce my guests, again, I want to welcome everybody back. And today we're talking about skin, and really kind of from an internal medicine as an internist, uh, I see skin all the time. And really one of the interesting things for me is, is a lot of the cutaneous, the skin manifestations of underlying disease. But we're going to make this show kind of fun. We're, you know, the last couple of shows we've really dug, that, dug into the, the granular levels of, of content and topics, but today we're going to have a little more fun. We're still going to get serious on some things, but we're going to have a little fun today because it's almost summertime. So what I want to do uh, is introduce my guests right now, and I am just so glad that they're here. Uh, I literally have a pen and paper because I'm going to be taking notes myself because I've got to. And uh, so I, mean, I know I'm propping up my guests, uh, but they're really, really good um, uh, experts on skin. So what I want to do is introduce my first guest. Uh, I've known him for a long time, uh, at least a decade, uh, Dr. Alex Charles. And Dr. Dr. Charles and I met um, through a lot of different things, actually. Uh, of course, from a, we have a relationship from a professional standpoint on a lot of patients of mine that have seen uh, Dr. Charles uh, in his practice. But we've also continued to bond even on a personal level. So uh, I welcome Dr. Alex Charles. Dr. Alex Charles is a board-certified dermatologist with DuPage Medical Group. You can check him out at www.dupagemedicalgroup.com. Dr. Charles, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here, Dr. G. Excellent. Well, what I want to do is, is I want you just to kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, um, where you did your training, um, and really how you got into the field of dermatology. Why don't we start there? Sure, sure. So um, I, I went to medical school at the Mayo, Mayo Medical School, the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And after I finished up there, I continued with Mayo for the first year of my internship down in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. 
spent a year down in Scottsdale before returning to Chicago. I'm a Chicagoland native. I grew up in Evanston. My family, my parents still live in the same house I grew up in Evanston, so I'm a local. And I continued my residency training in dermatology at Rush University Medical Center downtown. After I finished up at Rush, I was with a smaller private practice for just a couple of years before I joined DuPage Medical Group in the western suburbs. So now I maintain a practice in Hinsdale and in Lombard and also a, a go to an office in Naperville as well. Um, and I love the skin. It's, I think it's, it's the biggest organ that we have. It's so interesting. You can find all kinds of different, different uh, types of patients to treat. I didn't want to restrict myself to one type of patient, adults, children, or women. So dermatology allows me to see all sorts of different types of patients. Um, I can use my hands because um, I can do surgical procedures and I, I do a lot of minimally invasive cosmetic and aesthetic procedures, as well as just take care of general rashes, lumps, bumps, things like that. And um, I figured out very early on in my career that everybody has a question about their skin. I've yet to meet one person who doesn't have at least one question about their skin, so I have an endless supply of patients, no matter whether I'm here in the U.S. or any other continent. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Charles, for coming. I'm so excited to have him here. My second guest today, I'm super excited to have her here as well, too. Uh, and uh, my second guest, let me tell you a little bit about her. She and I connected through uh, another colleague of mine, another medical colleague of mine named Dr. John Bull. And, and when I was kind of coming up with the concept of this skin show, I knew I had to have a clinical esthetician on, but someone who's been, who's been seeing everything, can teach us ways on how to protect our skin, and really kind of emphasize the importance of skin. And so I want to welcome Ms. Mary Osmond, clinical esthetician at the John Bull Center for Cosmetic Surgery and Laser Medispa in Naperville, Illinois. Check her out at www.dupageplastics.com. Mary, welcome to the store. I'm so excited to have you on today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Excellent. Mary, why don't you tell us a little bit, a little bit about your background, how you got into this field uh, of being a clinical esthetician. Uh, please share that with us. Sure. I was I'm born and raised in the Midwest, and um, I have always been into health and fitness, and skincare kind of fall, falls in that realm. And I've been in the industry as a clinical esthetician for a little over 15 years. Um, I've had the pleasure of working alongside uh, many dermatologists and plastic surgeons, just educating their patients on the importance of skin care, as well as just performing a vast amount of uh, skin care treatments to help with their concerns. Ex I love it. Excellent. Thank you, Mary. I'm so excited to have you here. So there's our roster today of some great experts. And what we want to do today for you guys out there that are listening or watching us live is really I want to make this kind of a fun show. I mean, we're still going to get granular and get to a little bit of some of the details. But summer time's coming around. We are all are happy for this kind of time. We're all getting outside and enjoying our family and our friends and, of course, protecting our skin. So why not? Excellent. So I want to just couple, give you guys a couple quick things. Obviously, the skin is one of the most important organs in the human body and is certainly extremely important to our survival. As we know, skin is, is, has so many functions, protecting against infection, and other kind of toxins. Obviously, skin's allowed to help uh, absorb key nutrients and vitamins and minerals and oxygen and water. And there's a whole host of other kind of functions that are out there for our skin. So skin is, even though it's not unique to humans, it's kind of the quintessential identity of us as humans. Everything, we do fun things to our skin, sometimes we do bad things to our skin. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the bottom line is that skin is just our everything, and as Dr. Charles mentioned a few moments ago, it's such a vital organ. So what we're going to kind of do today is I want to kind of present some scenarios. So we're talking about summertime. Again, I want to stick with the theme, count down the summer. And really how we kind of start to show out is we always talk about what's called the chief complaint. And in medicine, when people come in and see us in our offices, or, or people come and see Mary for a consultation, there's really a reason behind that. So we call it the chief complaint. So the chief complaint today, the situation of the hour, is what should we really be doing to protect our skin during the summertime? So uh, I'm going to present some scenarios uh, and I want to kind of get, get our experts opinions on different things as we go through summertime theme-based activities. And I think this is something that people that are out there watching us or listening to us, this is really good information for you guys to take. So why not start out with some fun um, and we're going to go right into it. I think fun, summertime, I think of weddings, I think of parties, I think of, I think of uh, um, other kind of activities that you're going out for, family reunions and things like that, but this is a summertime theme. So, I'm going to start right here from wedding season and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Charles this first question. Uh, Dr. Charles, 
Are there any kind of foods to avoid before somebody's big wedding day in relation to skin that you may advise people about? So that's an interesting question, you know, and when we, when we look at the, the skin as the largest organ, we definitely know that nutrition will play a role in the integrity of your skin. If we're looking at the day of specifically, I would I would uh, <laughs> I would have to say to a patient if you're only uh, worried about your your food consumption and what's going to happen with your skin by the day of, or you know that's when you start to worry about it, then it might be a little late. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, there aren't any foods that I would necessarily point at and say eat this food and your skin will glow brighter on the day of, you know, starting just a couple days before, or eat this food and avoid it on the day of, you know, so that you don't break out. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go into. I wouldn't go into that specifically. Although I would advise somebody throughout their life. You know, you know, more more of a plant-based diet. You know, uh, more less meats or lean meats if you can if you can have them that way, uh, or no meats if you're able to if you're able to live a, a vegetarian or a vegan type lifestyle. Uh, but I'd, I'd love to hear what Mary has to say about it too. Yeah, Mary. You know, it's interesting from your perspective, and of course you're seeing people coming in for. Uh, facials, uh, microdermabrasions, other kind of skin procedures to get themselves ready for their big day. Are there any things that you kind of counsel uh, patients or clients that come in about maybe some do's and don'ts prior to somebody's big day? Absolutely. I, I would agree with Dr. Charles when he says it's a little too late if you're coming a couple days before your wedding to try to you know, get advice as far as what you can do for your skin. You definitely want to start early. Um, Foods that are rich in antioxidants, um, I think, are a good thing. Obviously, maybe eliminating some high foods that have high, high amounts of sugar in them. Um, the biggest thing that I would advise somebody is drink lots and lots of water weeks and weeks before your wedding, because hydration of the skin definitely shows. You look more glowing in your pictures. Um, so yeah, whatever you're putting in definitely does show on your skin. Excellent. I think that's huge. And it's interesting when I, when I hear some of your guys' uh, your, your, your discussion on that, um, the nutrition is, is paramount, and we're not just talking about skin because obviously skin is the largest organ in the body, but also from a general health perspective. So those that are that are out there listening, yeah, we want we want you to be as healthy as possible, and we want to try to give you the tips. But you kind of got you kind of got to walk uh, walk the walk and talk the talk, and uh, but yes, preparation for everything in, in life is very key, and preparation for your skin is key too. Um, Mary, let me ask you this: uh, say somebody were to get a facial or a microdermabrasion, what kind of benefits do you, does somebody see in, just in general, general talk, what kind of benefits do, do those kind of procedures offer for people for their skin? You know, facials and microdermabrasion, um, I think the important piece of those procedures would be the exfoliation. Um, anytime you're removing those outer dead surface layer skin cells, it's bringing the healthier cells to the surface, so it helps to smooth and even out the texture of the skin. Um, allowing again all their products to absorb better that they're using any of their skincare products and just again giving them that glow prior to a big event. Excellent. Thanks Mary. Uh, and I want to ask you a follow-up question. So say somebody is between, say somebody goes and they work with a clinical esthetician. Actually let me take a step back. Can you define the role of a clinical esthetician? Clinical oh. esthetician, you know, um, generally is in a medical setting, works alongside a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon or any physician. Um, in conjunction with what they're recommending. We often um, are prescribing or recommending products that um, are medical grade, meaning the active ingredients in those might be at a higher percentage. So we're kind of monitoring the usage of all of that. Um, we're also performing um, medical skin care treatments, whether it be microdermabrasion, um, chemical peels, uh, laser treatments, things like that, um, that kind of, I guess, are a little more results oriented to kind of uh, achieve whatever goals that they're looking for help improve their skin. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Charles, let me ask you a question. You know, of course, being a board certified dermatologist, you're working uh, with estheticians as well, too. Can you describe a little bit of the relationship between the dermatologist and the esthetician and how there's some synergies and how, uh, how you as a dermatologist and the esthetician can work together to formulate a good plan for your patients? Sure. I think there can be a lot of synergy, especially if you have a, a more clinically based esthetician. Um, as opposed to, say, an esthetician who's working in a standalone med spa in a strip mall without on-site uh, clinical supervision with a physician. I think there can be a lot of synergy when you have an esthetician who's in a medical office with um, a core aesthetic provider like a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon, maybe an ENT. Uh, what, we, what we do in our practice 
is we oftentimes will refer our patients to the esthetician to talk about some of the treatments that Mary has mentioned, chemical peels, microdermabrasion. Our estheticians are excellent at doing skin care education when it comes to sunscreens and uh, moisturization and different, you know, different aspects like that uh, as well. They're oftentimes, if they're clinically based, they are also, also oftentimes very well versed in some of the cosmetic procedures that the physicians will perform. Um, in my office we perform different injectables and laser procedures and so they'll be able to explain the ins and outs of those procedures to the patients, help prepare them for it, and also supplement the results that they might get from those procedures by recommending skincare products to, to help prolong the benefits that, they, that the patient might realize from the treatments. So there can be a lot of synergy, it's a great thing. Excellent. And, and as we talked about on this show before, those that are new to us, but certainly those that, that, that have been found us, you know, I really try to bring people together, my experts together, because it really is kind of the old saying, it takes a village. And, and, and when you have people that are working together to, to achieve a mutual goal, the, the possibilities are endless. And when we're talking about health, it does take a team-based approach. Uh, not only working with your primary care physician, but also your, your, your specialty physicians and other allied health professionals to really get to your, get to, uh, your goals that you want to get to. And so when we think about summertime, we think about going outside and everything, and I want to kind of piggyback on what Dr. Charles just mentioned about sunscreen. Um, I, you know, I, I get asked this question a lot as, an, as a primary care doctor. People come into me all the time, and of course, yes, I'm seeing a lot of things with skin as I'm listening to their heart, although you kind of observe this kind of integrative skin examination. Uh, but one of the things that I talk about when I see people for a physical as we get into summertime is you got to make sure that your skin's protected. So Dr. Charles, can you just describe to us in general and the people that are listening, what, what is sunscreen and what's its purpose? Well, so uh, a sunscreen is essentially a skincare product, usually as a, it comes as a cream or a lotion, sometimes as a spray or a gel, that when properly applied to the skin in sufficient amounts will provide coverage that will reduce the risk of the patient uh, burning burning their skin for a limited limited period of time. It isn't you can't put the sunscreen on and you're protected forever. Uh, but at least for a couple hours, it will allow the patient or the the individual who applies the sun sunscreen to be out in the sun for longer than they normally would be able to without burning in the sun. Uh, in addition to that, because they're not burning and because the sunscreen, if properly applied and if you selected the correct sunscreen, it will provide you protection against some of the harmful ultraviolet rays that you'll find in sunlight and uh, therefore it will also offer some protection for, uh, to the patient from developing problems down the line such as precancerous lesions, skin cancer, or um, what you know scares people even more, brown spots and wrinkles. Uh, so th those, those things will prevent as well. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, I, ha I had a discussion recently with a, with a patient of mine who's going to go on a, uh, on a trip, a uh, summer, summertime vacation, and I kind of told him, I go, you need to use your bottle. I mean, you should not, uh, one bottle should not last you a full week the way that you're going to get out there. You need to be getting multiple bottles and apply uh, judiciously and liberally while you're out on vacation. And he kind of looked at me like I was talking another language. And uh, that, that was about the end, the end of that conversation. But, but no, it's important to have this kind of conversation this time we were getting outside. And I'm sure you're seeing it all the time. As you, as you mentioned, obviously, a lot of cumulative sun exposure over a long time does lead to these uh, significant lesions. Uh, so let me ask you this. What's the, what's the, what are the areas that are most likely overlooked when people want to apply sunscreen? Well, clearly, unless you have some help, the back, the shoulder, upper shoulders of the back is a, a big problem area for people. Uh, if you try to apply sunscreen or certainly almost any skincare product to your own back, you're, you're probably not going to get enough coverage. Uh, it's difficult to apply it all on your own. You need some help to get that kind of coverage. For some men who um, maybe are, don't have as much hair on top of their head, they really need to watch out for that area as well. We, we detect a lot of precancerous lesions and skin cancers on the scalp of, of men who are balding. Uh, they can use sunscreens or they can take up a nice hat collection. Uh, you know, that can help protect them as well. Uh, older, some, some women who have lost hair, they, they can also be at risk. And um, I'd also say patients should uh, pay special attention to their ears. For some reason, people seem to forget to sunscreen their ears or the tops of their ears, and those areas can wind up burning more easily than other areas, too. Mary, when you see patients and clients come in, and, and of course, you've, you've, you see probably signs of sun damage all the time with, with, um, with wrinkling and some sagging and, and maybe some discoloration, um, do, what, what, I, know you're, I know you're likely advising them to protect their skin, 
what kind of barriers do you see between like you saying something and then actually somebody doing something? That is that happens a lot. Um, I would say with sunscreen in general, the biggest pushback is the way it feels. A lot of people don't like that heavy, white, chalky, like greasy feeling on their skin. Um, that's probably the biggest pushback, and then the whole idea of reapplying it throughout the day. Um, but sunscreens have evolved, and uh, there's lots of different types. They now make up tinted sunscreens um, so that all different skin types can wear them. Um, so I would say with sunscreen in general, that's probably the biggest pushback. Yeah. Mary, let me ask you a follow-up question. If, you, if you're seeing people that have some signs of sun damage, um, what kind of treatments are available for them from a clinical esthetician's perspective to kind of maybe help out uh, with whether sagging skin or... or, or or pigment, pigmentation disorders or things like that? What, what do you guys kind of uh, recommend for people? Um, for sun damage, um, broken capillaries, which is all, also can be caused by sun, excessive sun exposure, we do um, IPL, or stands for intense pulse light, or photofacials that help to kind of draw that pigment to the surface. It's, it's kind of singeing it in a way and then removing it um, and lightening it over time. Sometimes there's multiple treatments that are necessary with that. Um, laser resurfacing, and there's a bunch of different types of laser uh, resurfacing treatments out there. Uh, chemical peels is another option, microdermabrasion, and then just in between all of that, just make good maintenance with good products. I was going to ask you that question. I was going to say, what do you do for, for patients or clients that come in? They might see you once every six weeks or eight weeks, and then what kind of advice are you, are you telling them to do in the meantime? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, lots of education because obviously if they're going to invest the money in doing these treatments to... Uh, lighten their sun damage, you want to be able to make sure that they can maintain that in between. So sunscreen is the biggest thing along with um, uh, good exfoliation, good exfoliation products, whether it be a topical exfoliation or uh, some sort of manual exfoliation, a scrub, something they're using at home, um, and then just good moisturizer. But yes, the number one thing would be sunscreen and just limiting the amount of hours that you're exposed by the sun. It's, it's interesting when I think about, and as an internist, I just think think prevention. So I, when I kind of see people for their physicals, and certainly this time of year, you know, we're, obviously we're talking about labs and some metabolic stuff, but I'm also taking a quick look at their skin to see if I need to send them either to your way, Dr. Charles, or to your way, Mary. Um, but um, one of the things that obviously people don't necessarily do too much because it is hot outside, and <laughs> people don't necessarily want to wear hats, and they certainly don't want to wear long sleeve shirts. Uh, how do you, Dr. Charles, how do you kind of get past those kind of barriers, Maybe just the fact that somebody might have to put on more layers uh, to protect the skin? How do you kind of advise people about that? Well, I'll tell you, that can be difficult because it's hot outside in the summer, and so the more layers you have, you might you might get a little bit warmer. There are some some options. There's, uh, For example, there's a company called Coolabar that does you know, produce lines of uh, different sun protective clothing that's fashionable and some of it's lighter weight. Um, I also, as Mary alluded to this earlier, you know, I also talk to patients and say, hey, it isn't just about hanging out in the sun nonstop. Find ways that you can be smart about hanging out in the sun. Find ways to seek shade. So if you're, you know, if you're at a barbecue or, or at a picnic or something, try to stand under the shade of a tree when you can. Um, maybe don't try to avoid those events between, say, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. That's when the sun in the summertime is at its zenith, at its highest point, when you're, you're going to cast the, the, sh the smallest or the shortest shadow that you might. So it means it's overhead, it's really potent. So maybe try to avoid being outdoors or you know, uh, exposed without shade at that point in time. So it isn't just about wearing the clothes and wearing the hat and you know, having to worry about suffering about being, being covered up, but, but just being smart about applying your sunscreen and applying it often and seeking shade when you can and avoiding the sun when it might be at its, at its peak. Do you, do you recommend uh, any water consumption during that kind of time frame? If somebody's going to be out uh, for a couple hours, do you, do you recommend any kind of hydration protocols or anything like well, that? Well, if you're going to be out, I, I'll yeah. tell patients, first of all, it, it, all, it depends patient to patient because, you know, and as an interest, you know, some patients are, are going to have higher higher needs to hydrate because of uh, certain metabolic conditions or, or disorders that they have. Uh, I'll tell a patient, you know, certainly you should consider at about 12 ounces an hour uh, of water. If you are going to be outdoors, say, at a party or something where you're perhaps consuming alcoholic beverages, 
then you would really want to limit that because every alcoholic beverage you intake actually dehydrates your body. And so you need to be even more careful about intaking water. Not only does it, you know, it dehydrates, it acts as a diuretic, um, makes you make poor decisions, forget to apply more sunscreen. So you need to be really careful about that in the summertime as well. So I do talk to patients about that. Okay, excellent. Uh, Mary, let me ask you this kind of question. Uh, you know, I think about just day-to-day -day stuff, things that I can do or things that people can do. Is there any kind of day-to-day -day advice you kind of tell people, just kind of take care of your skin in general? We touched base on a little bit about like the nutrition or saying hydrated uh, water consumption, but are there any other kind of day-to-day -day kind of things that you may advise patients to just, just general skin care and that kind of uh, essence? Yeah, I think um, having a good morning routine and evening routine of just cleansing, getting all the oil, makeup, dirt, debris, whatever it is that's on your skin, also killing bacteria, um, a good moisturizer, as I mentioned earlier, exfoliation, um, and then the sunscreen, and then as far as day-to-day, -day, you know, referring to summer, um, I think a lot of people, when they're going to the pool, the beach, are kind of just, you know, uh, I would say not doing a good job as put, of putting on their sunscreen in a proper way, as you mentioned earlier. Um, so I always will educate them and say, you know, it's always good to apply it early, let it absorb a little bit, and then then get your swim trunks, then get your swimsuit on, because oftentimes people uh, will get it on and then the edges of their clothing will is where they'll have the burns because they're just not paying attention to that. So that's very interesting on that one, and it's and it's weird because like sometimes we're told, all right, you, you know, you put your clothes on first, and then you rub it on on the sunscreen, and you miss a lot of areas, of course. As you got some layers on, but that's very interesting. Is as I like that, get it on first, and then put your clothes on. It takes a little uh, more time. But... <laughs> <laughs> I know when you get like kids running around, they want to go to the pool. Sometimes we don't have that kind of time, and you say, "Hey, get back here! Get back here! Let's put that on." Uh, some of the areas that I see as as a, as a private care doctor, uh, some explosive, I actually see a lot of lesions on the lips. Uh, Dr. Charles, are there are there any products out there that might have SPF in them with like for? lip balms or things like that? What do you kind of advise on that scenario on lips? You can definitely look into that. There are, there are a number of, I wouldn't say that there's any one particular product that I, I would say go to, you know, this is a go-to product. LTMD, I believe, makes a pretty good uh, lip balm with sunscreen as well. But there are many different products you can find over the counter um, at your local drugstore that will contain uh, different levels of SPF. The, usually, usually they don't get too high. I, I've seen a lot of SPF 5s and 10s, and some of them will be a little bit higher. But you absolutely shouldn't neglect your, your lips. You can get lip balms that have SPF uh, protection in them, and you should apply them. And just like SPF uh, protection for the rest of your skin, sunscreen, in other areas, you do want to reapply these products probably every every hour and a half to two hours because they don't their, their uh, effectiveness isn't forever. Their effect, they lose effectiveness over time, and certainly they lose effectiveness with activity. You know, if you're swimming or you're getting wet or you're sweating and wiping your, your brow or wiping your mouth um, at, you know, at that barbecue again, then you're, you're going to be wiping off this, the protection that you so carefully applied. Excellent. I want to piggyback on some of the swimming stuff because uh, this is something that we're doing a lot in the summertime and, and uh, kids go to pools, they go to water parks, it's, it's really a lot of fun of course, even adults can have fun doing that as you chase your child around a water park. Um, but um, what kind of, I mean, let's, let's talk briefly a little bit about, about kids. Um, obviously kids have exposure to sun just as much as adults do. Um, and certainly as you're younger, certainly when you're born, your skin's a little bit more thinner. Uh, and then um, how do you kind of approach, I'll ask this question to Dr. Charles, how do you kind of approach getting your kids covered uh, because they may be at, even at more risk sometimes at uh, sun exposure uh, when they're little? Well, it's, it's a challenge. Actually, the biggest, the biggest issue, I think the biggest challenge, is that um, your kids don't want to apply sunscreen. I have, I have a four and a half year old and a seven year old, and sometimes it's a real struggle to, to try to grab them and keep them still for long enough to apply to apply sunscreen. I know that you probably, I think you I both go through, I go through the same thing myself. It's a common struggle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, so that's, the, that's the, the biggest issue. That and the fact that um, depending on the age of your children, if they're going to be, and if you live in a neighborhood where the children are playing with each other and they're out, out, out and about, they oftentimes won't come back for you to reapply that sunscreen, not on a time, you know, on a timely manner, not in a, in a timely fashion, uh, and they are going to be out there more. They tend to be out there in the middle of the day, or want to be out there in the middle of the day. That's the time they want to. When it's hot outside, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., that's when they want to go to the pool. Uh, and so, so it, it, it's it's a challenge. You just have, but as a parent, I think you just you just have to do it. You have to find a sunscreen that's palatable to you and to them. Uh, apply it. Try to get into reapplying it. 
and um, you just have to you have to chase them down. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I want to get into a couple other outdoor-based activities that we do, but I want to just take a brief moment to uh, give a shout-out to Elta MD, <coughs> our goal of sponsor today. Uh, Elta MD, dermatologists recognize that the most potent cosmeceutical that can prevent and reverse the signs of aging is sunscreen. For a sunscreen that will help you have healthy-looking skin for life, try Elta MD. Here's why we like it. All Elta MD sunscreens are mineral-based and feel weightless on the skin. Elta MD sunscreens are also broad spectrum. That means they protect your skin against the sun's UVA or aging rays and UVB or burning rays. Skin damaging UV rays are always present in all seasons and climates. Even if you're not at the beach, wearing sunscreen every day helps protect against premature wrinkles and brown spots as well as skin cancer. Elta MD is foremost for every skin type and lifestyle. Ask your dermatologist which ones are right for you. So Mary, let me ask you this question. Uh, as I'm reading that little mention from uh, Elton D, uh, for all skin types, how do you kind of approach uh, people with different kind of different skin types when you're talking about uh, um, some of the treatments that you're offering, people that have between fairer skin versus darker skin, what kind of re recommendations are you doing? Uh, sometimes people that have darker skin, sometimes the, 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 the discoloration may show a little bit more, but how do you kind of approach that kind of person that comes into your practice? Right, so darker skin types, um, tend to, are more prone to hyperpigmentation, so you have to be really careful with the treatments that you recommend. Um, there are some laser treatments that are great for darker skin types, and then there are some that are a little more aggressive that are not, or pose more risk. Um, t with darker skin types, I tend to recommend more chemical peels, home care regimen um, that will help. Um, I would say that's probably the biggest thing with darker skin types. Lighter skin types, there's, a, there's, there's more options as far as lightening sun damage. Um, so yeah. Dr. Charles, from a, from a medical standpoint, from a dermatology standpoint, how do you kind of approach individuals that, of different skin types, including people with darker skin? So I, I attract quite a few patients with darker, darker skin tone um, uh, who seek out my expertise because I, I do deal, our practice specializes to some degree in pigmentary disorders and so, um, and, and people with, with richer, richly pigmented skin oftentimes will suffer more from those disorders, so I'll have a lot of patients come here. To come to find me and seek me out. But I tell them, I tell all my patients, whether they have lighter skin or medium toned skin or darker skin, that they all need sunscreen. Uh, there are a lot of different sunscreen products out there, so we're very fortunate. Uh, you know, they have more elegant cosmetic formulations. Now you mentioned some of the Alta MD products. And I know a lot of my patients say, oh, with, you know, Doc, I'll put the sunscreen on and it'll look white and chalky on my skin. And I say, I understand. I don't want those sunscreens either for my skin, but I've been able to find sunscreens that I can put on my skin and they'll blend in, they'll look nice, and, um, and, and I don't have to look like, you know, like a ghost or look, you know, Look all chalky white, um, so <laughs> which is it's, it is it's a pro it's a, it's definitely a problem for brown skin people, but, um, and I think unfortunately that deters a lot of people from using sunscreen, and so I try to let them know there we've come a long way from you know from back in the day when you see those movies from the 50s and the 60s where the lifeguards got like white zinc paste on their nose. We have sunscreens that will offer excellent and high levels of, of SPF protection, and they're very cosmetically elegant. And so we sit and talk with them about some. We dispense different sunscreens in my office so we can have them test them right there right then and there and find a find a product that they like and if they do have some pigmentary disorders that they need help with then of course we we take a look at what the issue is and we craft a specialized individualized plan for them to help deal with it excellent thank you very much well um, a couple other activities that we're doing in summertime and i like this discussion where we're talking about some sunscreens and and just just knowing that people are going to get outside and how to best protect their skin i want to ask mary this um a lot of us out there were sports enthusiasts, or some of us are weekend athletes, or try to be weekend athletes before we injure ourselves. <laughs> but uh, but what kind of stuff are you thinking? You know, this is the time of season. You know, baseball, tennis, golf, you name it. Uh, badminton, maybe. Uh, I don't know about badminton. Uh, soccer, of course, and then um, and then families that are out and about. They're sitting in the stands, or they're watching. They're going to to sporting events outdoors. How do you kind of, why don't we start with like maybe some of the athletes that are out there, uh, say you're a baseball player or, or a golfer, how do you kind of advise them to protect their skin knowing that they're going to be outdoors uh, for maybe hours at a time without even getting any potential shade? Right, those outdoor activities, that's tough. Like Dr. Charles had mentioned earlier, a lot of the, the sun protective clothing, I think people, there's tons of companies now that provide that. Um, so tennis players, the golfers, they have the hats, the shirts, the pants, the skirts, whatever it is um, 
they have now, and then again, the sunscreen and reapplying every couple of hours because the number on the bottle does it, it's, it's deceiving. Um, depending on whether or not you sweat it off, you're jumping in the water, you're getting out, the goggles are going on, they're coming off, whatever it is, um, it's only going to protect you for so long. And everybody's skin is different. So reapplying it every couple of hours, if you're out and about all day long, reapplying, wearing a hat, and then maybe looking into some of the sun protective clothing. Excellent. That's kind of, and I want to kind of touch on what you said, said that sometimes, well, a lot of times, as you probably, and Dr. Charles might be able to come more, is what you see on the bottle is not necessarily what you get. Mm -hmm. Is there is there some kind of a, Dr. Charles, is there some sort of a, a kind of a rule of thumb? And like, say, for example, I have a SPF 15, what's I'm, what I'm actually getting, or if I have an SPF 30, what I'm getting, or like 50, is there any kind of a, a model that you kind of use that says what you're kind of really getting? You know, that's, okay, so that that's actually a pretty difficult question, because you're supposed to be getting what it says on the bottle, yeah. of course. Um, that's the that's the reason why it's printed on there, and the company wasn't allowed to put it on there until they proved to the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, that it would provide the sun protecting uh, the SPF factor that they said that it would. However, there are different there are a lot of factors that will go into whether you're actually getting what what's on the bottle. Some of those maybe have to do with the sunscreen product itself. It might it perhaps is degraded on on its way to wherever the retail shop is. Maybe it was sitting in a hot you know in a hot truck for a while. Uh, or, or perhaps it's expired. People, some people don't realize that your sunscreen does have an expiration date. And so you should look at the bottom of the bottle. <laughs> I never knew that. Right. <laughs> I, well, there, there you go. Well, excellent. And so I hope now you know and now hope your know. viewers know too. Yeah, we learn something every day. We learn something every day. So, Please and continue. So, so, so definitely look at the, if you actually purchased the sunscreen, say, a year or two ago, then you really should look at the bottom of the bottle and see if it's expired. If it has, throw it out and get yourself a fresh bottle of sunscreen that has yet to expire, or else you won't be getting the right SPF factor. Uh, you also need to make sure that you're reapplying it. You're applying an adequate amount. If you're going to uh, protect most of the sun-exposed areas of the body, say you're going to the beach or something, you need about an ounce of sunscreen, which is what uh, fits into about a standard-sized shot glass. And that would be enough to cover those protected areas. But that will only offer you protection for about an hour and a half or two if you're standing still in the sun. If you're running around you know, sweating, if you're swimming, if you're wiping it off, if you're putting a hat on and off, goggles are on and off, then you're diminishing the effectiveness of the sunscreen as you're wiping it off in those areas and as time goes on. And of course, other ambient factors will play a role, uh, you know, depending on your latitude, where you're located, what time of day it is, if there's cloud cover, those things will all affect um, what, how much ultraviolet light exposure you're actually getting. That's, I, I'm just still mesmerized from the shot about <laughs> the expiration, expiration date. Oh, this is really bad. And at the same thing, at the same time, we're talking talking about some patients that I, that I see, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I've got the same bottle that I've got from last year." I and I feel like I'm one of those same people too. But this is a this is certainly an eye opening uh, no. uh, discussion. So again, we can offer practical tips for people out there. Check your bottles. So I know I got to check mine when I get home and. And probably go to the store and buy some new stuff. There's yeah. no doubt about that. Uh, but I want to pick back on, on what you're saying again. The, you can't underestimate the, the importance of reapplying, and, and that's just something that, that we, we, you know, you, sometimes you get caught up in the moment. You're having fun. You're out there with your family. You're eating barbecue. You're swimming. All that kind of stuff. And then you forget all the stuff that's making that that, that not only go away, you're drying off or things like that. You're sweating, but then you forget to reapply. So let me let me ask you this. Let me ask you a follow-up question, Dr. Charles. Um, we know that cumulative uh, sun exposure does lead to basically, let's be honest, skin cancer, um, which is the most common uh, cancer in this country. Um, when, of course, there's various types of skin cancer and, and of course, the, the, the very dangerous uh, malignant melanoma, before we get into that, uh, uh, how is, like, a best way to, you know, say you're seeing somebody in the office, uh, how, how do you best approach, like, just doing a quick skin exam on them to see if there's any risky lesions at all, or, or how do you just kind of just approach a patient that comes to your office and you look at their skin from a prevention standpoint? So full body skin exams are something that's probably one of the most important things that we do in our office, and we do them on a daily basis. In our office, our, our patients will disrobe um, almost completely, or maybe just at least down to, to their underwear. And I'll start at the scalp. I'll look through their, their scalp, pushing their hair out of the way, and look through their scalp, examine the face, the ears. I actually look inside their mouth as well. I look in the oral mucosa to make sure that I don't see any obvious signs of oral cancer, 
the neck, the arms, the chest, the back. We, we look everywhere. We look at the bottoms of their feet. We look between their toes. People don't realize that you can get skin cancer there as well. I always like to explain, you know, remind my patients that's what you know killed the late great Bob Marley. It yes. was a you know skin cancer on his foot. Um, we look at their at their their bottoms, sometimes their genitalia as well, and we also educate our patients that they should be spending at least 60 seconds every month, maybe just a minute a month, only 12 minutes a year, looking their own skin over on a regular basis. That way they gain familiarity with lumps, bumps, and spots. Uh, and that way they know if something new is there or if something has changed. Uh, and then we give them education materials that show them what different skin cancers look like. Malignant melanoma gets a lot of press and it's a bad kind of skin cancer, but it's not the most common type of skin cancer. There are forms of skin cancer that look just like a little mosquito bite. Um, that, that, or a little pearly bump or a, a scaly, maybe painful red spot. So we try to educate them about the other types of skin cancer as well as malignant melanoma and how to detect it and how to keep themselves safe. If you had to kind of, kind of I don't want to kind of put you on, I kind of am putting you on the spot. It's like, hey, it's my show, okay, it's show. and you're here as a guest on my show, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. Um, but um, we know that we can be honest and say not everybody's got a dermatologist. Um, you know, what's kind of you know, how do we create that urgency in people that know that they have risk because we're going outdoors all the time? How do you create that urgency in somebody to say, hey, you know, establish a relationship, you know, first of all, have a medical doctor, have like a primary care doctor who's, who can help rescue you in, the, in case of emergency. But how do you kind of make that, uh, you know, how do you kind of step that relationship with, with a dermatologist? How, do you, how can we kind of create that urgency uh, for, again, the most common cancer in the, in the country is skin cancer? Uh, and as you said, of course, melanoma, uh, the, the numbers of the, the incidence of melanoma has only increased dramatically. I was doing some research to, for the show today, and I found an interesting stat that said the incidence of melanoma uh, in 1930 in this country was 1 in 1,500 Americans, and currently it's now about 1 in 49, American, 1 in 49 Americans. And so you're seeing, potentially, I mean, you're seeing a lot of devastating stuff all the time and making those diagnoses. How do we create that urgency? And people to really value their skin. Well, that's a, it's always a challenge to, I think, and you, you, you can speak to this even as an internist, it's a challenge to create urgency in patients about many aspects of their skin, I think, the, or, or, or their health period, not just their skin. I think one of the best things to do is try to what, do a show like what you're doing right now. I think you need to empower patients and help them realize that they, that they can take control of their health more so than they might have thought before. That they, the decisions that they make on a daily basis really have a big impact on their health and that goes for their skin as well. And so, you, you know, it's, a diff, it's different in my, in me as a dermatologist. Pretty much I, I say to people, anybody who walks through my door, my office door is already self-selecting as somebody who's already decided that skin is important. So, you know, so, they, so they're already coming in, so I've, I've got a captive audience. And so I can, I can educate them not just about their acne, but also, you know, if they're a youth, I can educate them about sunscreen, about sun avoidance and what they can do, do in those ways. But if, they're, if there's somebody who, who, who hasn't seen a dermatologist yet, and they're seeing an internist, or they're, you know, or, or they're seeing their esthetician, or they're not necessarily plugged in with anyone, anyone at all, then, you know, when I talk to them, when I see them, I tell them, hey, this is important. You can see your skin. And one of the, the cool things, if there's ever a cool thing about skin cancer, one of the cool things is actually you can detect it with your eyes. You know, a lot of internal cancers, you've got to wait for pain, or you have to wait for some sort of symptoms, or, or who knows what. But most skin cancers, you can appreciate it visually. So it's one of those things that we, we tell patients, ultimately, you could really take control and power into your own hands because you can detect and keep your, you can save your own life. You can save your, you can save your, your spouse's life. I have, a, I have a colleague of mine in dermatology whose spouse spotted her melanoma wow. on, the, on the back of her leg. Um, and and she's, she's a dermatologist and she looks herself over all the time. And, and this was something that she overlooked, but her spouse had learned so much from her <laughs> about, about sun protection that when, when he noticed this, he said, hey, you know, we need to get this checked out. And sure enough, she had a malignant melanoma that was growing in, a, in an inconspicuous spot. So I think it's just a matter of, of building public awareness and letting people know that they have the power to, to take command of their own health. Excellent. Mary, let me ask you from your end, because from a, a, from a clinical esthetician uh, perspective, you're seeing a lot of skin uh, challenges too. You might be seeing skin lesions. You know, how do you create, we're trying to ask, answer this question, how do we create that sense of urgency in people? No different than like creating a sense of urgency in, in diabetics or people with hypertension, uh, uh, you know, things like that. How do we create that urgency from your perspective? You might see things and, and, and you may counsel your patients, you know, to go, but, but how, do you, how do you address that urgency 
uh, especially when sometimes people come in for clinical estheticians, they just come for their skin and their treatment and then out the door. Right. It's, a, it's constant education, um, making skin important, not just for beauty purposes, for anti-aging, but also just the overall health. And, and spotting those things, if we see something that's suspicious or just doesn't look normal, or I didn't see that the last time that they came in, it's recommending they go get their skin exams. Wow, that's, that's perfect. Constant conversation. And it comes down to everything when we talk about, and that's the, the purpose of, of the show, and when, when I wanted to create the show and, and leverage some of my networks, it's really to get people that are out there listening to us and watching us uh, to, to know that, hey, there's people out there that, that want to help you. There's, you don't have to go at this alone in life and health. We want everybody to have the, uh, the, the best health possible to the best ability that's possible. We want people to have those tools uh, and, and resources for success, whether it's with your skin or whether it's with somebody with diabetes or somebody with their weight. And so, uh, so it starts with, as, as everybody's saying, it starts with, with um, um, making that decision. When you walk in uh, to somebody's office, you're being intentional. And I think when you have that intention, in the intentional aspect about you, then you can actually now start being aware and making that change. So I think that's just, just a, a fascinating thing, but we have to make sure that we can all rise to the occasion and all create that opportunity. Um, I want to ask this. You know, we're talking about skin, you know, skin kids right now, and, and I want to kind of ask a little bit about kind of facts and myths. And I want to do something a little bit fun here. And, uh, and I want to ask our panel a couple of things here. But uh, I get a lot, asked a lot of questions all the time, and I alluded earlier, and I had a patient that said, oh, it's okay, if it's, is it okay that I have like a little bottle that'll last me my full week in, uh, in, on vacation? The answer is obviously no, you need a lot of bottles. But, but there are a lot of things that, are, that people have some myths about skin and skin cancer. So I wanna ask this first question uh, to Mary. And so uh, the, the, your answer is gonna be either myth or fact. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. Here's the statement. If I put sunscreen on in the morning, I'm covered all day long. That is a myth. <laughs> <laughs> hey, please, please tell me why, why you believe that's a myth. I mean, it is, it, there's no doubt. Mary, Mary, Mary knows her stuff. <laughs> but it's like, I, I mean, this kind of sound really, really ridiculous. I mean, but, 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 you know, not, people have questions, and I would say, if you don't have a, if you don't, if you got a question, ask a question. I don't care if it sounds ridiculous or not. At least we're trying to give you education. So, so please explain uh, why that is a myth. Well, that's just, I mean, that's just that we think that's funny, but there are a lot of people who do that and think that they're protected all day long. So again, it just goes back to education and just knowing that um, putting one, one application of sunscreen daily, you are not protected throughout the day. You have to reapply or, you know, keep yourself shaded, as Dr. Charles mentioned earlier. Just expose your sun, yourself to sun much less. All right. Next, myth versus fact for Dr. Charles. Here we go. Here's the statement. I use an oil suntan lotion that says SPF 15, so I'm okay. <laughs> That's a huge myth. Did you say suntan I did, lotion? I did, yeah. I did suntan lotion. <laughs> oil. oil suntan lotion oil, oil. with an okay. SPF 15. I think an oil suntan lotion is a good way to wind up like bacon. They wind up, <laughs> you know, crispy. And it doesn't matter. If it, it's almost, it doesn't make sense that it has SPF 15. I'm not sure why they, yeah. why they put the SPF in there. Um, I don't ever recommend that you tan under any circumstances. For your viewing, your listening audience, by the way, please understand there's no such thing as a base tan. If you're going to go somewhere, you know, on vacation, people are like, oh, I'm going to go to the, the suntan parlor and get a base tan, so that way I'm protected. That's, there's no such thing. That's, you're just adding additional sun damage, additional ultraviolet light and DNA damage that predisposes you to brown spots and skin cancer. So you shouldn't use suntan lotions at all. You, just, you shouldn't suntan unless it's a tan in a bottle or a spray tan. Uh, and if you want to go that route, then that's safe. But I would not recommend a tanning on, under ultraviolet lights, be they natural or you know man-made. Excellent. No, that's actually a great, great, great statement there because people will ask me a lot of primary care is it okay to tan? Of course, my answer is no. But it's interesting that there's some alternative things that are safer, like a spray. Uh, so this is great information for people out there. Uh, next, next statement. Um, and we'll do a couple more, and we'll wrap up. Uh, so this is for Mary. Uh, myth versus fact, sunburn continues to burn your skin even after getting out of the sun. I would say that's fact. Correct. And uh, please, can you expand on that a little bit? Um, my understanding just with the UVA and UVB rays is the UVB are those burning rays and it's essentially breaking the capillaries in the skin. Um, so that can continue to redden as the day goes on. It can continue to break as the day goes on, and then that painful 
feeling that people get can set in. So and you often don't notice that until several hours after being out of the sun. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next to me, here we go. Um, this is a myth versus fact. Here we go for Dr. Charles. Skin cancer doesn't run in my family, so I don't have to worry too much about sun protection. <laughs> that's obviously, that's a myth. Uh, I will say that malignant melanoma, which is the one of the worst forms of skin cancer, there is a strong genetic component. That's what we're discovering. So if you have a family history of malignant melanoma, especially in a first degree relative, a parent, a sibling, or a child, then you should definitely be getting your check, self checked out because you're at high risk. But most, because most skin cancers are caused by ultraviolet light exposure, excess exposure, it doesn't have to run in your family. Uh, it's your, up to your own individual risk. And if you've spent a lot of time in the sun, cumulative, or if you've received several sunburns over your lifetime, then you're at increased risk. Excellent. And I'm going to ask Mary the last skin uh, myth versus fat question. Here's a statement, Mary. I don't need sunscreen on cloudy days. I would say that is a myth. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. The sun is deceiving, and I believe in cloudy days, there's about 40% of the sun still, you know, coming through. So just because you feel shaded doesn't mean that uh, you're not absorbing those harmful rays. So you should treat a cloudy day just as you would treat a sunny day. Excellent, thank you. So we got just a few minutes left, everybody. I've been really enjoying this discussion and uh, talking about different different scenarios that you might find yourself in the summer. Uh, but the bottom line is that we're all talking about the same theme is to protect the skin. So what I do at the end of the show, I always talk about, we, we did in the beginning of the show, our chief complaint. Again, how do you best protect your skin during the summertime months? And so as we kind of wrap this up the, uh, with an assessment plan, I kind of want to, uh, an assessment plan for those that, that are new to the, to the program or those that have been following us and don't know, that's when you kind of, somebody comes in, you examine them, you hear their story, and then you kind of give them their diagnosis and their plan of care. So with that being said, I'm going to ask Mary, and just to, uh, as we kind of wrap things up, Mary, why don't you give us just a couple kind of take-home points, you know, as you think of skin being so important, what are some take-home points that people that are listening or watching us can, can take home with them and apply right away about their skin? Um, I think the biggest, biggest discussion we've had is obviously protecting the skin, so I would just say using a broad spectrum sunscreen that helps prevent against or helps you, your skin uh, absorb less of the UVA and UVB rays, reapplying every couple of hours, um, limiting yourself to how much time you spend into the sun um, and wearing a hat. That would be one thing. Um, I think it's important um, to get your skin checked, you know, whether it's yearly, every six months, just to make sure that uh, whatever you are seeing isn't evolving or becoming, um, becoming a concern. And then um, I will always say to drink lots and lots of water because it does make a difference on your skin. Excellent. Dr. Charles, final thoughts on skin. So I agree with Mary. I think number one is avoid the sun, and if you can't avoid it, protect yourself in the sun. With sun protective clothing or a broad spectrum sunscreen, minimum SPF 30, and find one that you like, so that way you find less uh, excuses for applying it. Uh, I also do recommend establishing a good relationship with a dermatologist or with your internal medicine or family physician who can help protect your skin. And then lastly, something I alluded to earlier, spend some time looking your own skin over. You can do it in your, the privacy of your own bathroom or your own bedroom, wherever you are. You can become familiar with your own skin, and that way if something changes or something new pops up, you're more likely to notice it and you could potentially save your own life. Excellent. And my kind of final thoughts really center around prevention, prevention, and more prevention. You know, we're here in this time, in this life, and we have this amazing opportunity. I was trying to tell some of my kids the other day that we're on a planet that spins around the sun in the universe. And so we're blessed with this opportunity to, to enjoy life, to enjoy our families. And as we get ready for summertime, this is the best opportunity to rededicate yourself and refamiliarize yourself with your health. And not just skin, but just everything else. You know, we want people to get outside, enjoy the weather, enjoy your family, enjoy your loved ones, move, drink water, laugh, smile, set the tone. There's so many things that we can do during this time, and we're blessed to continue to do it. So with that being said, I want to thank my guests today, Dr. Alex Charles, board-certified dermatologist with DuPage Medical Group. Check him out www.dupagemedicalgroup.com and Ms. Mary Osmond, a clinical esthetician at the John Bull Surgical Center in Naperville, Illinois, uh, www.dupageplastics.com. I want to thank my sponsor again today, Elta MD Skincare, www.eltamd.com. 
My name is Dr. Mark Gomez. Uh, next week we're going to be continuing our final series of Countdown this Summer. We're going to be talking about Healthy Eats. Remember to check me out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at tyourhealth.g or check me out on my website www.drmarkgomez.com. See you guys next week and peace out.